Hello, welcome after two years, I think two years break seems like normal, like typical meetups. I'm very happy that uh, we could meet in person again. Uh, today we're gonna have like three talks and pizza in between uh, with beers, possibly beer as well, and water of course, it's a bit hot here, but we we'll manage, I hope. Uh, the meetup is called in English because we are live streaming, I'm not sure if, if like everyone's speaking Polish here as well, so the English is like the official language, but yeah, if you need to ask uh, the questions, you can do that in Polish and uh, repeat them in English, so don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess uh, enjoy uh, today's evening. Our first speaker is Maciej. Uh, Maciej came to us from Berlin. Uh, he works at JetBrains and likes creating uh, all the cool stuff. Uh, yes, a sponsor of the uh, the meetup together with, with the company that I should mention first because it's my company, so it's <laughs> very important, but doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so from JetBrains and he's like doing all the cool stuff on YouTube. You check it out. Uh, follow my check on Twitter. And now uh, programming with functions. It's like one more thing. Uh, in this season, hopefully, that will not end with another uh, lockdown. We hope to have more beginner-centric talks, and that's what uh, Maciek wants to like start with. Uh, just to like you know, uh, we as our community here also more welcoming. Okay, before, without further ado. I'm transferring. Thank that. you. So yeah, if you are, uh, so yeah, if you are not beginners, please uh, try to brainwash yourself a bit and think that you are beginners. Um, actually, this is going to be, I hope, good for um, almost everyone because um, I'm talking about. Uh, I would like to talk about things that. Um, uh, should work also for people more uh, like more advanced, but more advanced technically. And the talk is more about uh, some soft skills or the way we learn about things. So uh, generally, um, if we start with uh, uh, if we talk about functional programming, the one thing that comes to mind uh, is that we are uh, we have all these ideas about. Uh, trans transparency about the uh, category theory about all the mathematical stuff and that's also something that yeah let's just let it go to this point no, no, not to this point to this point Hi. um yeah uh, so uh, the idea for the for, for this talk, for this video, and also for like a series of videos afterwards, um, was that I saw during the last few years uh, a certain trend on YouTube and on on Twitter that um, Scala is getting more focused on some very advanced high-level theoretical stuff. We uh, and it tends to be more um, about the big framework, so like Cats and Zio. Uh, so uh, when, we, when I was talking to beginners, they were quite often a bit intimidated by it, a bit like uh, thinking that Scala is building like an ivory tower for itself. But we are uh, like when we start working on Scala, you should already jump into all this very high level stuff. And um, quite often, without with going around the basics that uh, should be somewhere there in the beginning, uh, taught to us. Um, on the other hand, the fact that we have those people uh, who who already teach zero cats category theory and so on uh, means that there's over there is some rise in criticism in that we should uh, like the whole Scala, like, like since one one side says that everything in Scala should be about that fun functional programming in in the big with big F big P, then there's a criticism that all of that, all the functional programming is already useless because it's too complicated, too uh, too far away from our usual uh, way we program and basically it's not needed for real work stuff. Um, so yeah, so we have like a two camps and the 
the human mind uh, likes to think in, think in extremes, and one camp says that functional is great, the second that maybe that functional is completely not great. And uh, then we can go to Twitter and fight about it instead of trying to find uh, the middle ground. But also, if we find a middle ground, quite often that middle ground is not the uh, not something that joins to uh, the good sides <coughs> of both uh, concepts, but something that is neither neither of of them. Like functional should be secure, so functional should be um, more abstract, more easy to read and write. And imperative can be faster. Imperative can be more down to earth, but something in between can be neither secure nor faster and uh, just full of bugs all the time. Um, so yeah, so we decided now that we we want be in that middle, and instead we can just we can just put ourselves in one camp or the other and fight. Um, this is also going to be like a manifesto for me because I like I strongly believe that simplicity is very important, and uh, I would like to talk about it a bit maybe. And anyway, later like I don't think that this talk will take more than twenty minutes maybe. And after that, uh, if you have questions or something like more like a comment on a question then please do and uh, we can have a discussion about it so yeah um, I wanted to start a bit with this um, Immanuel Kant is a guy from the 18th century uh, 18th century that um, proposed that uh, the whole progress in the world of ideas in philosophy especially about generally also in in many other fields is uh, going in circles by, um, the, by, by going from the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Thesis is something that uh, generally someone proposes, in our case, that proposes that we have some problems and we have a way to solve those problems. Uh, but then, quickly, um, as a reaction to that thesis, we get someone who proposes an antithesis, uh, like uh, something very opposite that says, no, this, what are you saying, saying here is bullshit, we, sh we shouldn't do it at all. And then we go through a, like a period of discussion about both things, and somewhere there, in the middle of it, in, as a result of that discussion, we get a synthesis out of to a positive views into something that says mm, maybe we we are able to somehow merge together good things from both and somehow avoid the bad things from both. So we get something like a, a new idea that comes up from uh, merging these two. But in that exact moment, that new idea becomes a thesis of its own, and in the same time, someone will propose an antithesis to that new thesis and so on, and so on, through centuries. And I think we can use this also, we can talk about the functional programming and imperative programming this way. That, and it doesn't really matter which one is the thesis and which one is the antithesis. We can have, um, we can say that we have problems in IT, that we have uh, big systems that need to be worked on, that we have uh, smaller systems but we need to scale them, that we, we have a lot of uh, a lot of programs that are bug buggy and we should do something to make them <coughs> less buggy. And the functional programming is this idea, this first thesis that says, okay, we can do it by making things more academic. We can make everything more abstract, we can make it the, this way in our code will be more secure, more uh, concise, more scalable, and so on. Um, but then we have imperative that says, well, those guys from functional programming, they really don't, ne never wrote anything for, um, for, um, for full time. They just sit at the, I don't know, the, their YouTube or the, the academia. And, um, so, and the way to write code is actually just write one thing after another. And this way we, will, we can do things quickly and we can do things simply and this is actually readable because this is like people, this is the way people think in just statements. And, um, and yeah, we have those two, no matter which one is which one, but we can probably uh, somehow think about the, the way to uh, connect them and to have 
the advantages but not disadvantages. Immanuel Kant didn't know anything about programming. I don't know if he would agree with me. Um, yeah, so I made this. I made like a, a series of a series uh, of uh, well, like I, I had a brainstorm with my friends and I uh, I wrote this series of uh, scripts for uh, for videos and I made uh, videos about. Okay, so what what are the elements in functional programming that are, that are actually I think are important and these are not something that. And, and there's, there are enough arguments to say that even if you are a um, programmer of some imperative language, then it would be nice if you had this in have you if you had this in this language. And it wouldn't be academic. It shouldn't be academic. It shouldn't be uh, full of some uh, uh, computer science jargon. And definitely, there shouldn't be uh, monads in it. Or maybe I'll probably add it a little bit. So first thing is uh, the, the term that I really like is programming with functions. This is actually something that uh, uh, Martin Nodelsky came up with. That when we think about functional programming, then we have all this baggage already that functional programming is this and this and that. And programming with functions is simply programming but with functions. Like you, you, we usually think that we have data, we can make operations on data. If we program with functions, then functions are data as well. This is simply another type of data that tells us what to do with other data. So we can have a function that is like an argument in uh, another function. We can have a function that is returned from an, another function. And we can also compose those functions. Uh, those are like we can make operations on data, we can make operations on functions to create new functions. And that's already programming with functions. So now we have functional programming to, just, just like this. Um, and then if we have those, if we have functions like this, and we can use them as arguments and as return values, and if we can compose them, that actually helps us achieve type safety. Meaning that, uh, well, each, func each function is defined by the types of the arguments. It's defined by the type it returns. And on top of that, if we just name things right, which is very difficult in every programming language, but if we try, then we already have this minimalistic but always up-to-date documentation that we can give other people. That um, if, we, if we are, I see on the screen that this method, this function, is uh, taking these arguments and it returns that, those things, then I can already I already have some idea about what, how it works. Um, and, well, type 30 would be like a lot of arrows would go there. Um, um, another, another element is option either try, which is that a little bit of monads I would like to anyway teach to people, but not much more than this. Uh, all three are very simple monads. And uh, well, there, there are simple, simpler monads than option probably, but they are probably also completely useless. And these three are great as a way to extend our ability to program <coughs> with functions. For example, taking a partial function and turning them into total functions. So we can have a function that operates only on a subset of data we claim that it, it can get. But uh, and with option or either or try, we can uh, we can make it into like a function that will operate on all data and it will just return no none or left of some error uh, or fail failure of a try when it uh, when it's not in the subset. There are also other ways, for example, other. Mm, way, other ways it can be useful to us, for example, in error handling. So with those three, we can handle errors as also as data, and not we don't have to throw exceptions. We don't have to uh, somehow, I don't know. So we don't we don't have to have some special constructs. Uh, we we can use this to uh, to also like. Uh, um, describe our errors. It also makes a great way to uh, the line that the error is something different than a bug. When we have an error, 
this is uh, this means that some data that we are getting from the outside is not what we thought. Yet. Maybe we don't, we didn't get the answer to our HTTP request, or maybe we uh, we have a JSON that can't be deserialized, but not because we don't know how to do it, but because the JSON is just some nonsense. So that's an error, and we can we can describe it with with our data with our types. And back is something that is actually in our code and it's just work, not working properly. Um, and then, yeah, error handling also helps achieve type safety because of that we can now add types that describe errors and they are def on the same level as all other types in our code. So even if you are, I don't know, I wouldn't say Java, but would say, I don't know, C++ programmer or whatever. Um, these are things that you should be able to like have in your mind that, okay, it's, it will be nice to have it. Um, next, we have expressions over statements, like another, uh, 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 let, okay. Expressions over statements is, uh, is an idea that um, okay, a statement is simply uh, a piece of code that we can um, that has like a, a few lines that should be uh, a few operations that should be executed one after another. They are usually quite long because uh, in statements we uh, rely on that order. We say, okay, we can uh, if we do this, then we do then only then we can do that. So there's like a some sort of a motivation to keep them. To, uh, to keep those lists of, uh, of, uh, of operations together. And a statement is something that doesn't return, return anything, right? It's like you can, it's basically a function that returns nothing or a unit, and everything, what it does, it, it's done by changing the system, so basically by side effects. Um, the contrary expression is always return, returning something, in Scala, we don't uh, have a way to say that an expression should be pure, so shouldn't make any side effects. But this is kind of what where we go, where we are going with this. Like with expressions, we are motivated to not make side effects, and instead we can have like a piece of code that actually takes some data, um, makes some operations on it, return it and it can be connected with other expressions. So that, that plays very well with programming with functions because every expression is basically can be a function and every, ca every function is, can be also inlined into an expression. In Scala, we even if, else, like match case, for real today are all expressions. Um, Yeah. On the other end of this, we have immutability. Like, if we have a, uh, if we have a, um, well, programming with functions means that every time I have a like a set of some data, um, then I can mm, get a new set of data by using a function on them. So uh, I remember when when I started, and the first thing was okay. Well, data needs to change, right? So the the way to do it would be to go and change the data in place. Like everything should be mutable. Then I found out that okay, well, well, what about what if I just use map for it? If I then I have a copy of that original data set with some elements that are somehow transformed from the from the original data set, but I still have that original data set. It's not changed. So and then suddenly, like well. Okay, maybe that's suddenly like in which time. Um, it became obvious that by using functions and by stacking the operations made by functions on one onto another, I don't really need mutability that much. And that's something, and uh, in most cases, my original data sets just stay the same and I just create new ones. Um, immutability helps a lot because, of, because I'm lazy. Uh, yeah, okay, let's. And I'm talking about laziness also because I'm really lazy, but also like, uh, but also in case of lazy val, which is the simplest way uh, to have it, because if everything around me is immutable, um, then a function I will call will 
of course, only uh, have the same result. So it's easy instead to just memorize that result and to return next time the function is called with exactly the same immutable data, then I will just return that result. Um, it's also great for thread safety because uh, this is like a usual thing that if we have a, a many threads accessing the same data, then if they mute that, if they make changes to that data, then we have we, we can have many risk conditions. If we, if we doubt if the data is immutable, then no matter how many threads there, there are, we can simply uh, we, we can sim simply make it work, and there's no problem with. It. Um, yeah, so again, these are concepts that should be obvious that it's better to have them than not, and they can be easily uh, achieved by um, having uh, by some very simple functional programming techniques. Um, another, uh, yet another one is that we have in Scala in many other languages uh, which get some FP. Um, we have field traits, we have anons, and we have case classes. And uh, in this, um, like in this whole diagram, uh, I put them here because all them, all of them, um, make our data, our types, uh, more narrow. We can think about, especially these two first field, field traits and anons, um, can be used to um, tell the compiler that we need to work only on some very narrow data types, like uh, if we only need a few options, like one, two, three, four, but we don't want to use the help integer, then we can only s we can simply say get an enum that will have only those four options. Um, with field traits, uh, there are more uh, more possibilities to create like a hierarchy of data than in with, with enums, but the idea is ex more or less the same. We can use it to say that, okay, this is all we have, like I built that hierarchy of data types, but this is all we, all we have, there will be no more, so we can be, we can create our logic around that and we don't need to uh, then uh, worry about some situation that uh, will not happen because we covered everything that is possible. Um, case class is of course a bit different situation. Case class is mostly about so this wonderful syntax sugar that can give us um, a very s some data structure with some additional uh, methods, and that's it. So instead of of writing the whole class and then um, and then adding methods to it, I can just write a case class and be safe and be sure that this is only used for a, in a specific way. Um, and that, well, that also help with readability because I can simply, um, uh, because writing a case class is of course much more concise, also using enums and field traits can lead to, can lead to more readable code because I don't have to worry about some corner cases when we, when the data I use is of the type that, uh, like, that, well, I can I can simply say that okay, these are all the possible cases in my logic that are that um, my data data could be used in, and there will be for sure nothing more. Um, and yeah, and also expressions. If we use expressions that uh, also have readability, um, mostly I'm thinking here about that. Uh, if we start to write expressions then we can easily see that every expression we use is uh, composed of other expressions. Every such expression can be then um, like either, uh, if we need that, we can, it can be easily refactored into a function. That function will have its name, will have, have its parameters with its names and with its types. We have, we will, it will have its <coughs> results of a given type. So that will also create a piece of this minimal always up-to-date documentation, and it will also say a person who will read that code what exactly is happening there. Um, and some other things, like kiss over dry. Uh, yeah, um, kiss means here, um, uh, keep it simple, silly, 
uh, dry means don't repeat yourself. And uh, it's the best if both work together. So if we don't repeat uh, our code and uh, just if something is similar in a few places, we refactor it and put it in one place. But also it's important, and I, I would claim it's more important even than that, to keep your code simple. And sometimes it means that if you if you actually have like a few things in your co code that look similar, but making them into one thing would create more problems, like would create like a bunch of abstract and uh, complicated code to just make in order to um, to make those things into one thing. Then maybe it's better to keep it separate because the simpler the code is, it's more readable and it also helps with all the other things. Um, expressions, I guess it also help uh, to have expressions here because with, with expressions and with the ability to create like a many small functions, uh, many of those functions will be similar, but that they are similar doesn't mean that they need to be uh, made into one function. Like it's not a problem to keep many similar functions uh, as as long as they are readable, as long as they are type safe, and so on. Yeah, and uh, the last one is composition over inheritance, which is kind of a verse. It's not really a, a concept that uh, that is like uh, somewhere between functional programming and uh, iterative programming, um, but I. I uh, think like because functional programming languages got some um, got some popularity, got talked about. Then um, thanks to that, we uh, so we started to see better that inheritance is not the best strategy to and um, to like enlarge our uh, and to make our code uh, more flexible to add some new logic, but instead composition that is having uh, some mm, traits that uh, show uh, what our code can do is a better way than to uh, inherit the old code uh, by, and this way showing it. Um, yeah, composition also helps readability, or even though inheritance can be better for don't repeat it yourself. Um, in, on the YouTube, I have a for every of these uh, concepts, I have a separate video. Um, yeah, and I also wanted to uh, promote myself a bit thanks to this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can um, you can find it uh, find the whole uh, the whole series about how to write your code uh, a bit more concise, a bit more readable. Um, Every video is backed by a mm, blog post that is virtually a mm, transcription of that blog post. Um, that's on WordPress. I made copies to Medium, but uh, I don't really uh, use Medium anymore. Um, it's not e it do, it's not that easy to do to keep everything in place, but yeah, I, I tried my best. Uh, what else? Yeah, that this is the don't repeat, this good, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, difficulty level is about lower intermediate because I don't want to, um, like, if you if you really, you are really, really beginner, then, then it's most, more important probably to just uh, work with, uh, with some um, examples and learn some text and learn some very simple projects first. Uh, this is more about like a stuff that you could learn when you already know the basics, the complete basics. Um, yeah, and I I wanted to be also like a form of discussion. If you, I'm always uh, ready to uh, to talk about it. Uh, yeah, uh, going back to to one thing that I think is very important here: the key for dry. Um, mm, I think keeping things simple is more important because, uh, but but keeping things simple is not crudeness. It's not not like uh, if we talk about uh, the in the in the terms of uh, programming, then we can say that crudeness is when we uh, write code only so that it works, that 
uh, we try to not write any abstractions because that will make our code uh, that will just take time and we don't have time for it. Um, that uh, optimization is always bad because it's, uh, it also it takes time and we, we just want things to work. Although here we can say that this is, this is change, uh, this can change uh, switch places because if you we talk about comple complexity, people often say that we should make things more complex, but then say that optimization is always premature. But, um, yeah, so simplicity should be somewhere in between. It should be something that is uh, that makes code readable, that makes code uh, better, but it should stop at the point where the, not the amount of complexity starts to be a complexity for itself. So, like, um, there is something that is called the law of dimin diminishing returns, that at some point in your work, additional work is actually, uh, you do it only because it's, um, it makes you think that uh, this additional work makes m make things better, but it actually you stop doing that. And people often do it because they think that they will it will make them look smarter. So yeah. And uh, while I agree that a monad should be called a monad, I can't help but feel that poles are called catamorphisms because it makes the color sound smarter at least in part. So Nicholas actually. Uh, let me <laughs> use this with. Um, if you uh, uh, if you want to uh, s look to show to if you want to um, watch videos about more complicated stuff in functional programming in Scala, uh, Nicholas is uh, a great author. His uh, his videos are also on YouTube. And uh, yeah, let me just see where I am. Point. Uh, so that's not to say that complex programming techniques are useless. I don't want to say that uh, that you shouldn't learn some category theory. Well, if you want to, um, but you should always stick to the basics. Um, the trick is to know the basics so well that you're able to recognize uh, to recognize when when you actually need that complex things or and when the complex things are just uh, can be achieved also in a simpler way. Um, and yeah, for example, uh, for many years I learned Aikido, and Aikido is really great with all the very complex movements and very fine looking, very interesting ways you can throw someone to the ground. But it's not so good for self defense, really, it's just like an art. And for self-defense, kickboxing works much better, even though it's like four kicks and six ways of punching. So um, running away is always safer. <laughs> <laughs> even that. <laughs> so, and even simpler. <laughs> so yeah, so that, that's kind of maybe like a stretch, but I would say that, yeah, first learn the basics, know what you can do, learn the more complex techniques later and uh, then and know when those complex techniques are actually useful and when it's just like a way to show off. Yeah, often you will find that, that the basics are just enough. Um, one more thing I would probably wanted to mention is that, of course, mm, this is all theory and it doesn't uh, mean that you have to uh, program in Scala to do it. Like, I use Scala in all my work, even though I some, somehow uh, sit on the fence, because uh, even work in JetBrains means that I uh, do a lot of things in, in like, a, a using code written in uh, in Kotlin or in Java. Actually Kotlin together with the Arrow library is uh, also very good functional programming language. I also like Rust, although there is le uh, all the time there is some discussion about if Rust is mm, like, if it's not, so, some things that Rust wants to do don't play well with functional programming, but it's many of, of interesting co concepts are there. And even like in languages like Swift, Java, or maybe or even C sharp, we have some glimpses. We have some little things that are uh, that are inspired by uh, 
by Scala or by Haskell, or more, comple more complex functional programming languages. One thing though that I, so like all of those languages I, I like, I think they are great, but one thing that I would like to be very, uh, very stressed, uh, I, I am stressed right now, but uh, I would like to talk is that um, it should be a language that is type safe, that has strong types. Um, type uh, safety helps understand the code, helps in refactoring, provides that minimalistic documentation, and can save us from countless bugs. So as long as the languages you use are at least in some way um, friendly to functional programming, and as long as they are type safe, great. Um, is there anything else I have here? No. OK, the last slide is just like a prompt to that. There will be something in the next video. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on YouTube, and I hope you have some questions. Uh, yeah. Now comment on the question, if you permit. Sure. So uh, for me, uh, there's one thing conspicuously missing from your, your diagram of cool stuff. Because I, yeah. I like uh, all the stuff that is on the diagram, but Let's for me, yeah. one extremely important thing is missing. Uh, and you mentioned it in passing, uh -huh. referential transparency. So for me, that is the main difference between functional programming and not functional programming. I, I started to, to learn functional programming about uh, 15 years in my career, and this, this was the idea that really blew my mind, because referential, referential transparency is something that helps you reason about the programs. Because if you have uh, referential transparency, you can refactor at will, because you can always inline an expression, and you can always extract an expression. And if you want to have that, this forces you to have immutability. Because if, if you don't have immutability, you have side effects, and you cannot extract the expressions or inline them because then the, 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 the behavior of the program changes. So for me, that's, that's the main driving force. And another comment is that, in fact, you don't need to have statically typed language to, to uh, get some benefit from functional programming. Because if you have an imperative language that is weakly typed, that's worse than imperative language that has um, referential transparency. You can have functions in, in bare JavaScript, but if you force yourself to not to do the mutations and you start to, to write immutable code, you already read the benefits. Uh, okay, two things. Um, let's start with that. Yeah, I kind of um, merged together functional programming with type safety here on purpose because I think that two work very well together and I don't want to talk about them uh, abstractly like, okay, we have some type safety here and this is functional programming there. I think that in, in practice, it's the, the best um, results we get when yes, we have yes, them I together. It's not just, not just plus, it's more like exponential. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't put referential transparency here on purpose as well, uh, because I think it, uh, it, is, yeah, it, is, it is important and it's good to learn about it, but uh, in some situations um, it limits us. Like um, instead, I would I like to f talk about that function functions like you we know, use should be could be pure or, and can be uh, can be total. Uh, but if enforcing functional uh, transparency means that a lot of mm, a lot of time we we write code is spent on achieving that referential transparency for the sake of having referential transparency. Like when you, ha when you want to have a log statement, 
and and normally you would just put print line somewhere. But no, you won't have reference on transparency mm. with print line. You need to go somewhere around and put it in another way. I'm uh, willing to compromise. On the if line. you if you want to have a bit better performance, it's often easy to do it by putting a cache in memory when you if if the um, the original computation means that you have to. At, uh, you have to catch mm, data from internet or from the database. But if you have a cache that's mutable, you want it will be want to be uh, transparent, referentially transparent again, because the second time you do it, something else will happen. You, know, you will only get the data from the cache instead of the original points of computation, and so on and so on. And um, in the end, I think that um, there is a reason why Scala is not completely pure. That the, we have, the, we are on this place in the whole spectrum of lang programming languages where we still have the ability to uh, to use mutable data and not to be referentially transparent, and that's on purpose as well. Like it, it can help us sometimes. Not always. I, yeah, immutability is important, but in some cases, I think it's good to have it. So, and putting referential trans uh, transparency here, that would be a, like a two strong statement in my opinion. Ask me things. Come on. <laughs> it can be stupid. No problem. No? Nothing. All right. So, thanks again. I took my very good <laughs>
I'm writing and developing in Scala for a few years now. And I would like to talk a little bit about this tiny library called Type Level Mouse. Uh, first things first, how many of you ever heard about this uh, library from Type Level? Uh, let's say before reading the agenda. Okay, one, two, oh, three possibly. So yeah, that was uh, kind of my case because I've been using I've been using uh, type level cuts and cuts effect for actually many many years, and I've heard about type level mouse only about recently. It's a tiny li library that, but the, the, the tiny li library that actually changes quite a lot when utilized, uh, especially when it comes to either T and option T, and that's kind of the main main topic of this presentation. Uh, I'm working at Scalaric. We are uh, based in Krakow, uh, and we are developing this social media uh, marketing platform called Tagger. Uh, if you like uh, writing idiomatic functional Scala code and uh, uh, working on some you know big projects uh, with lots of data, but without Apache Spark, Hadoop, and MapReduce, uh, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, definitely visit our website. We are still hiring. So uh, jumping to mouse itself. So mouse it's uh, as I said very small library from type level and basically what it does it provides some uh, utilities for the things that you can see on the slide. And that's that's basically it. And uh, well you might think why we actually need a separate library for such utilities. So there's even, I guess, uh, an issue for that uh, in <laughs> on the mouse GitHub. Uh, the, po possibly the long-term uh, goal is to merge all these things into cuts, into type-level cuts. But for now, it's just a separate library. But the library that is worth to, to know, it does not have um, documentation. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's sure they keep the good stuff. Yeah, the, the good parts. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually not needed because if you just go through these um, um, few files that you will find on the repo, I don't know how many, uh, just, just a few probably, it takes, I know, about five minutes to go through all of these th methods that, uh, that are out there and you, you know, all, know uh, all the library. Just follow the types. Yes, basically. <laughs> but yeah, in, actually, in this case, it's actually. Uh, that's actually everything you need to know. You just follow the links from the readme, jump to the files themselves, and you basically know everything. The, the methods are just one-liners, so uh, no documentation needed. Um, question to you, how many of you are familiar with this concept of I.O.? How many of you use, read, read about it? Okay, so, <clears throat> so not that many. So I think we'll go through something that I will call like two minutes. Two minutes introduction to to I/O. Okay, bear with me. So, um, for all of those of you who uh, are not familiar with the topic, don't worry. Whenever you will see this type, this I/O type on the slides, you can basically think of a, a, a future from Scala. It's it's uh, just enough for this presentation. Uh, so to level the playing field for, for all of you, um, think of it as you know this better shiny future. Of course, it's a huge exaggeration um, to say that. Uh, sorry, maybe not exaggeration, but um, it's it's actually um, not that uh, accurate to call the I/O uh, just a better future. It's way more than that, but it's just enough for this presentation. Uh, so if you go through this very simple example. You know, no, no I/O here. And we all know that it call that this code basically prints uh, the, the string once, right? Uh, why is that? Well, it, we all know that it uh, works that way. But why it works that way? Well, the, the thing is that future is so-called eagerly evaluated, right? So when the, when the execution comes to the place where the future where the future is defined, it kind of executes right away, we could, we, we could say. But, but here's another question. So the, the question is, should it be the behavior that we expect from this code, right? Should it actually work that way? Because, well, we are aiming basically for as much of 
as much uh, of the code reusability as possible, right? We we want to write once and run everywhere, right? So um, uh, should it actually work that way? Uh, with the uh, when we, in the case of I/O, when we when we replace the, the things with with our new new type called I/O, it kind of changes the situation dramatically because now when mm, when we use it twice, okay, it actually prints twice. Of course, we, we have to call this uh, maybe a, s a little bit spooky method called unsafe run sync, and uh, you can think of it as a, I don't know as a run method, right? So we define first and then we run it. Right. And uh, in a, if we embrace type level cuts to the next level, and instead of uh, this extends up that we normally do, when we do uh, extends I up from, from cuts effect, uh, we don't even have to, which what is actually recommended, we don't have to call this unsafe run sync anymore. We basically implement this run method that returns uh, exit code within the I.O. And uh, why is it all of that, why all of that is important? I know it's like a little teaser and you might ask yourself, well, why just not to wrap function with another method and call it twice? Like I said, it's just a teaser, so it's maybe uh, everything that we can do within uh, two minutes. This is important part. The referential transparency, yes, we, <laughs> we, we've, we talked uh, a little bit about it previously. So IO, I when compared to future, IO is referentially transparent, so that's the key here, right? Uh, uh, if, if that's a new term to you, uh, just don't worry. It, it's basically really, uh, it's basically just a nice term to use during your, your next uh, recruitment process. <laughs> uh, so definitely look it up. Uh, so is, summarizing, um, when it comes to benefits of I.O. over the future, for example, like I said, it just was just a teaser, but um, basically I.O. separates code uh, definition from the code execution. And that, in turn, um, um, that gives us a, a separation. Um, uh, that, that separation, sorry, gives us more control over the code that we are writing, and that, in turn, improves the reusability. So, like, there's three main parts that you can think of it uh, when when talking about I/O benefits. Now, because it's mostly about this either T and option T thing. Uh, I mean, probably this whole presentation. So the question to you, how many of you are familiar with this concept of either T, option T? Okay, okay, quite a lot, people. But not, not everyone. <laughs> so, uh, not everyone, so, but don't worry, we're, we're here to learn something new, right? So, um, uh, when it comes to either T and option T, what is it all for? Again, it's, it's from the type level ecosystem, it's a thing from the type level ecosystem. And uh, what, what is it, the purpose for, for that? So basically, when we are dealing with eaters, when we are dealing with options, especially when it comes to asynchronous code, so within the futures, within I.O., uh, we are suddenly dealing with these you know, nested uh, structures when it comes to return types. Okay, so whenever we want to map, whenever we want to flat map, uh, filter, whatever, Suddenly, we <coughs> cannot uh, call it uh, uh, for, for, for that type because we need to, to do that within that I.O. So we suddenly end up with a code like map, map, flat map, flat map, uh, and so on. So the idea, and uh, I think it comes from Haskell basically, the idea is to, to combine these things together, so treat like either and I.O. together, so uh, we can write less or less boilerplate and our code is much more readable, right? So if we combine it together, we can think that we've got this either I.O. thing, but uh, we don't because we have something more more general and it, it's called either T and it's actually not only for, for I.O., it works basically for all these effect types like I.O., future, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, this is actually the example from the CATS uh, documentation. And um, let's, let's say that we've got these two simple methods. 
right? We are uh, parsing double from string, okay? So that may fail, so this is future reader. We also then have uh, divide, uh, we are dividing asynchronously, don't ask why, it's just this example from the documentation. <laughs> but uh, why, why is it uh, either? Well, it's either because uh, uh, someone may uh, come up with an idea to divide by zero, and that probably shouldn't throw exception, right? We are doing proper scala <laughs> here, right? So um, the example goes this way. So basically when we have this division program async, don't you, d you don't have to read all, all of this code. The idea is that it's not that easily readable, right? So uh, you, we have a kind of a repetition, right? Because we have we can fail with this uh, first uh, uh, method execution or the second uh, method execution. Like we duplicated future successful left. And uh, the question is, can we do any better? Yes, when we are using either T, we can actually write it this way. So suddenly, same things, same same output, but drastically different code. Check out the documentation. It's actually uh, mm, uh, explained really, 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 really well. But yeah, this, as with all uh, examples from the documentation, right? Things get a bit more complicated over time when you use it everywhere, and you actually will sooner or later use it almost everywhere. Why is that? Well, basically when dealing with asynchronous code, especially the code that returns options, uh, ideas, right? This um, uh, often the, the time that uh, the core business logic is where we actually use these things. Like, so w when it comes to core business logic, there's lots of these either T, option T types. And um, yeah, when, when it comes to asyn uh, asynchronous code, and sooner or later, you will discover that this is actually quite a lot of boilerplate when it comes to using these uh, these uh, these two things. Uh, although we've been all said that well, it's actually it actually helps us uh, uh, to write uh, less code. Mm -hmm. So uh, if for a moment, imagine uh, that we've got this very kind of naive um, uh, hierarchy of uh, errors, right? Uh, especially these three, but uh, possibly even more. And uh, yeah, uh, imagine I've got this also very simplistic uh, business logic. We have some asynchronous code, right? We've got two IOs. We've got two methods, one returning either to uh, second returning option, right? So we kind of uh, have all of the combinations. And if we try to write some, um, some, some code with it using either T, especially when it comes to either T, we end up with something like this and um, someone may argue that okay it's, uh, it doesn't uh, do anything fancy it's actually very simple business logic so why it looks like that there is uh, so much uh, boilerplate here well the, the answer is that because there's actually quite a lot of boilerplate here so we start everything with either t we we kind of explicitly specify from option from uh, from option F right uh, we um, maybe you will notice we even have this left widen call so uh, to make this thing compile even all even though we are dealing with a single um, error hierarchy right with this error type mm -hmm. and no attachment is again fro from this hierarchy we have to call this left wide and say well we are still dealing with the same error so um, yeah the, 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 the question is can we do any better and uh, uh, the, even if you will notice we got this either t uh, condition okay so to kind of do a s simple fork and if we look closely is also kind of a tricky one because if someone will specify the types, uh, it's actually quite uh, legible, right? But if someone omits, uh, sorry, not the types, but uh, the parameter names, right? But if uh, someone uh, tries to write it this way, so mm -hmm. probably like most of the time, um, this is actually kind <laughs> of misleading because yeah, you. Yeah, we suddenly realize that, well, w when it comes to uh, the, the method uh, like uh, s uh, definition, right? The, the, mm, you, may, oh yeah, you may expect that that will be on the left, like part of this, uh, uh, of, of this me uh, method parameter. So the second parameter would be left. 
and the, the last one we write. But it's actually the other way around, right? Because uh, we first specify the right, and then only we specify the left. And I suppose it's uh, possibly because it tries to mimic like the if statement, I guess. Um, so rather than fold function, rather than fold function, or like okay, I expect left to be on the left. But so, but <laughs> so yeah, it's like yeah, it seems like the uh, logic stuff. So. I'm not saying like it should be the other way around. I'm just saying that it might be misleading if we omit the uh, parameter names, right? Uh, especially if it's not something like unit, but specific types. It's kind of um, background, I would say. Uh, so how about the, this type level mouse? Uh, is it kind of a rescue for us? Uh, so if we add it to our SBT dependencies, uh, the latest version, right? And, and if we call this single import statement, that's actually all what we need. And it's not the s same thing as with uh, cuts implicit. You can write it actually write it this way. The first one is for Scala 2. The second one is the different syntax for Scala 3, if, if someone is on, on the edge. And uh, if we, <laughs> yeah, and if we've got the same business logic, it's exactly the same business logic as before. Uh, also, again, with this naive uh, single error hierarchy returned uh, by every single uh, method, it, it actually uh, looks this <coughs> way. And I will argue that it's actually, I hope that it's quite visible fr from here. Um, I will argue that it's actually way more readable and also that is kind of more kind of more idiomatic I would say um, if we uh, for a uh, second uh, forget that we are writing this flat map f flat map uh, what is what is it flat map in etc uh, and it's if we for example for for, uh, for a second uh, thing that we are doing with a plain old flat map it's uh, actually it feels kind of like Vanilla's uh, Scala code uh, again, and uh, also you may notice that well, it's not all that great because we have this kind of nested to right within the map. Actually, I hope in the next version of of type level maps because there's a, an issue for that. There will be this to right in method uh, coming in the next version. So uh, uh, j just a little bit a bit more readable. And uh, that's also the hint if you are dealing with this uh, library and you will f suddenly figure out that there's some method missing, feel free to, to add a new issue for that. And there's al always within the same day, there's discussion, should we add it or not? Um, and uh, the question is how actually it works underneath. Uh, the, the idea is super simple. The idea is basically to define this uh, methods and obviously not only the, these methods, but uh, a, a bit more than that. Uh, for this uh, type uh, f uh, either, and so thinking about f, it's basically any effect type that co conforms uh, conforms to the types. So, for example, either. And if we omit uh, these uh, implicits uh, that are needed here and there. Uh, it actually looks uh, quite simple, right? We, for example, whenever we've got this uh, in suffix, right? Uh, we're basically doing our plain old map or flat map, but within that effect type. So, for example, if we are doing map in, we are mapping from the right to another type A, and we end up with the same type as we started. So, F either uh, L and A, and. Uh, Basically, that's a kind of uh, thing to remember how, how these uh, methods are called. Whenever we are dealing with something like the, the si simplest stuff in type level maps, it's it ends with in, so mapping, flat mapping, etc. But if the method that we are putting there uh, inside is um, returning uh, something within the effect, so like flat map f, it's the suffix is uh, the suffix is f, so flat map f. Get a f, and it's all I got. I just added these uh, two in the end because they are kind of really, really useful. Um, this uh, get a race, uh, get a race uh, message. Uh, it also simplifies the uh, uh, code uh, in in many ways, many times. Um, same is for options, almost like uh, symmetric, I would say. Uh, the, the question is, uh, having all that, uh, can we actually? 
uh, use it everywhere now, if we want, right? Uh, do we still need either T uh, or an option T uh, if, if we use it before? But actually the answer is yes, we kind of need uh, to use it still. Uh, why is that? Because, well, either T uh, in uh, many cases play uh, nicely when it comes to these four comprehension styles. So if we uh, find these four comprehensions to be uh, nice and readable for us, uh, while uh, with this kind of maybe called business logic is a slide of exaggeration, but having these three methods, we can combine them together like this with either T, but with mouse it would possibly look something like this. So we end up with these uh, nested structures uh, once again. Why is that? Well, basically because flatmapf or map in flatmap it won't work. Uh, with uh, four comprehensions. So if we have, um, so if we have um, codes, like from the first example, that forms kind of, uh, kind of like pipeline, right? So we've got an output from first method, and it's the output from for the second method, and so on. You've got kind of this pipeline. We can basically chain the methods from mouse, uh, and it works nicely. But if we've got uh, examples such as uh, this, so we kind of fetch a few things and then we put it together uh, in mouse view and up with these uh, nested structures, unfortunately. So um, if we come to the conclusion that we, have, we want to have a tool for every single case, so um, not, not something like this that sometimes is useful but uh, not in every case, uh, the question might be, uh, okay, are there any alternatives uh, to this either T option T and to mouse if we don't find it uh, useful in, in the end. Uh, you can check out this uh, repo called Monix Bio. It's actually from the Monix, I would, I would say, Monix ecosystem. Um, but it has some interop with type level cuts, uh, so uh, it should work really nice with your code base. Um, it's vastly different concept, but check it out if, if that's something you, you haven't heard of before. Also, there's a thing called sealed monad uh, from, from Eternals, yeah, and it's also, again, uh, again, it's, it's a totally different concept, but definitely check it out if you haven't seen that before, but it generally addresses the, the same, same issue. But, um, the last thing probably, the mouse is not only about either T, option T is basically a library that combines a few utilities uh, here and there. Some things missing from the Scala standard library, some things missing especially from, from the CATS uh, itself. Uh, so uh, we can just put up a bunch of probably useful stuff here. So whenever we want to parse something as a float but don't have an exception, we can use parse float from, from mouse. There's this map keys method that is missing from Scala standard library, but Sometimes you might find it useful to, to map this uh, within the map. It's also there. You don't need, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if we're dealing with some nested structures, possible list of options, map nested too. And also, if you will um, find yourself in need to use either T at the end of the day, but you don't want uh, but you don't want to write in, I know either T from either and you know with this standard syntax you, you can use this to either T method and also if uh, you are dealing with tuples for, for some reason quite a lot uh, if you want to get last element every single time you don't need to specify this like underscore three underscore four it's possibly also but but prone sorry uh, you can just basically um, call the method last. And yes, that's the last thing uh, generally, so that would be it when it comes to type level mouse. It's really fine library, but definitely check it out. I hope you will find it useful and uh, generally um, slides from this presentation will be on my Twitter page soon, uh, I hope. So uh, feel free to check it out if you want to get back to some examples or, or some names. Uh, I don't know, these this, this libraries I've mentioned. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. There's still time for questions. Yeah, if, if there are some questions, uh, I will definitely.
uh, want to, to, to hear anything that comes to your mind uh, when it comes to mouse, when it comes to either T. I don't know, maybe you've tried it before and you haven't found it uh, useful for some reason. Okay, so I think we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. So, a couple of announcements before our last talk today. Uh, first, it's raining, so it's, like, don't go out outside. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's the first thing. The other one, still some beer, and Tomek, the next speaker, told me that it's going to be a long talk and you need beer for it. So, that's like quotation. Uh, so, yeah, you should do, should do that probably. Uh, the next thing. We kind of trying to restart the group again uh, after pandemic, so expect more meetups in like uh, next month. And uh, we'll try to do the usual uh, beach party that will probably take place in August, but also something special next month, I hope. We'll see. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to say thank you to our sponsors because it wouldn't be possible without the sponsors. So. Uh, if you want to learn more like about iterators, talk to me or my colleagues over there. Uh, if you want to know more about IntelliJ, talk to Mate. You met Mate uh, during the first presentation. Last but not least, we are planning to go for s go Sorry. somehow to like after party. <laughs> if there are like people, if there would, if, if there are people like wanting to go, we'll figure out best way to go? I'm not sure what boats. that would be like. Boats? <laughs> boats, <laughs> yeah, yeah, boats or taxis, <laughs> depending on how heavy the rain would be. Uh, yeah, so like three minutes break, Tom, maybe just plug in and we'll start uh, the, the last presentation. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, so uh, our last speaker, Tomek, I asked him how to do it on whiskey, but he was like, I'm sure someone has made something up. He's like, aspiring startup, and also like a big fan of checking the return codes and storing errors in strings, so programming Go, obviously. And, uh, but yeah, but today, like, uh, my talk will be about Loom, so don't worry, probably not. Go in that. <laughs> I, I kind of like uh, like in the kitchen that it's not going to be able to go. So I'm no, no, it's not. But there will be C sharp, for example. <laughs> so about even worse. So warm welcome to Tom. Thank you. my talk, uh, Where Did Future Go? So the talk is about Project Loom. If you haven't heard, but Project Loom is basically the newest addition to the JVM platform. Uh, it's like a new underlying threading model that will be introduced to the JVM. Um, it's not actually yet released. It was like uh, matched to, to, the, to, to the main line. Uh, there are like ready builds with the JDK 19. You can download them. All the code you will see, at least all the code that I wrote, all the code I wrote here. Uh, was compiled with this JDK, so it works. Um, so I think JDK 19 will go live this year in October or something, so this is like the perfect time to actually look into, into Loom. Why? Because it would, at least I think it would change a lot how we write code, not only in, in, in Java, but also in Scala, because the changes are fundamental for the platform, not only for the languages. Before we go to the details, like a few words about me. So I'm Tomasz Kowut, uh, I'm co-founder of Scattered, uh, a startup that is creating uh, digital advertising tools in the making. What I do now, I do day-to-day -day coding. Earlier I was like a solution architect in a uh, company that was working in this ad tech space, so pretty demanding systems. But what I was doing mostly there was like uh, moving Jira tickets, spending my time on teams and writing marketing. No, I'm kidding. I, I was also doing some kind of coding, but, uh, but no matter. So um, I'm somehow like connected to Scala since 2011, so almost, all, all, almost over the decade. Uh, I started with Scala 2.7, and I went up till 2.13. And now I'm a Go programmer. 
So that's probably like, so what you're doing here, right? Almost <laughs> Kalamita. So the interesting part about this uh, Go thing is that actually Go has a very similar uh, trading model to what Loom will bring. So I have some kind of like uh, thoughts how it might affect how the code on the JVM will change uh, and, and do some kind of um, uh, comparisons. Okay, so before we talk about Loom, I would like to talk why we started using futures in the first place. Because like we're all fine doing like normal functions, right? Where's our final functions over there, right? And in and, and general, wh why, why we started with async, right? So um, I would like to go with some kind of like an example of how we ended up with futures. So I would like you to go with me to build a server, like from the ground up. So like every server needs some kind of a database, right? So we have, uh, do you see the code? Is the font okay? Because I cannot make it small. <laughs> so take it or leave it. Uh, so, so yeah. So here's like a, a, a simple database that's like an in-memory database. You have like a backing it by a map. There are like a few users over there mapped with their IDs. Uh, this is like a key value store basically. And you have like one single method uh, get that takes the user ID as long and it turns the user. But there's a twist. There's a thread sleep over here. Why? Because I want to de like assimilate some kind of like a real workload, right? So every time you would call some kind of uh, database or something, it would take some time. Obviously, maybe not five seconds, that would be like an awful database, but still, like, this is for the purpose of this presentation, I think this five seconds is, is more or less okay here, right? Okay, now, how the server would look like? So the server would be, uh, would take the database, of course, by reference. I want to extend thread because I want the server to run apart from the main thread because I want to run the simulation in the end. We have, like, a list of incoming connections that are coming to the server. So we are storing it in a linked blocking queue. We have two methods, basically uh, run that is coming from thread and serve. So basically serve is called when you want to do a request to the, to the server. Uh, the server returns a connection to you. And this connection, what it has, it has the request itself. And this array blocking queue of size one, this is place where the server will place the response, basically. Uh, if Java would have some kind of like a single memory cell that would be enough, but there is nothing in Java like that, so I had to use this array blocking queue of size one. So this incoming connection is being put into this queue here, and the connection is being returned to the client. And what the server does in this like run method, basically spins in the wire through loop, tries to take a incoming connection, and here we will need to handle the connection. All clear? Uh, by the way, if you have some kind of questions, I'm not clear, that's probably me, me, not you, so please ask, and if you want to argue about something, that's also uh, something I would like to hear. Okay, so now uh, the client part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the client part. So the client part obviously needs to uh, handle the server. It will have some kind of request that it will send to the server. It's also a thread because it will run asynchronously from the main thread. And basically, it prints out that it's calling the server. It's calling this self method from here. So it will get a connection. And here it tries to get the response from the connection and print it out. Right? Also, I think it's also not uh, very complicated. So how the main method would look like, the whole simulation put together. So we have the server, it gets a new database, we start the thread, we have a list of clients that will do the, uh, that will call the server, we start them, we join the server so the main thread wouldn't finish before, uh, before the whole simulation ends up. And here is the place where you put the business logic, right? So this is the place that you are being paid for. These things like gives you story points in Jira, etc. right? This is basically the business logic. So we need to handle the connection here. So let's write a, like a simple method. How, how would like the handling of connection look like? So this code goes over here. So basically we, we get this connection that the server gave us. We call the database with the uh, user ID that was put into the request. If there is like no user in the database, we, we return in the response not found. If there is some user, then we return OK with the, with the user that we got from the database. Right? So now let's run the simulation. 
So this is like in SBT, run, running clone main, blah, 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 starting server, calling server, accepting connection, calling server. You can see that this is like server logs, client one logs, client four, etc., etc., accepting connection, and here are the responses. So it's like expected, like three of them were in the database and one was not over there. Okay, so but do you see what's actually, because it is not okay, what's not right with this code? Do you see something fishy here? Uh, the response of one of the clients was like five second, seconds uh, to, to uh, add one, or I don't know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If you look at the timing, you'll see that the client one started the, uh, the, the call the server at like 28 seconds and got the response at 33. That's like totally normal because there, yeah. there was a thread sleep of five seconds. But client, the, the, sec the second client got the answer after 10 seconds. The client three got the answer after 15 seconds. Oops, sorry. And the fourth client after 20 seconds. And this is like, this is not maybe something very unusual, but basically this is not how server should work, right? So we need to like fix it. So back to the whiteboard, we need to change this uh, business logic. <laughs> so basically, we, like the logic is okay, but we need to do something. So what, what would you do here? Well, yeah, we need to like multiple chat basically, right? So this is exactly what like in the old days when you had this model of Java, like normal Java, I don't know, EE or something, you had a thread per request model. So we leave the business logic as it was, we put it inside a runable, and we spin up a new thread, start this thread, and now let's look at the simulation. All good. The server is fantastic, right? Nice job. Well done. We can like ship it. Okay. Now, so so we have shipped it. Like your startup is gaining traction, and now, wow, five five thousand clients at the same time, right? So we're going to simulate a five five thousand connections to the server. So I've changed the main method a bit. There are no uh, uh, client classes over here in threads because I didn't want to spoil the the, the simulation because all each client also started a thread. So I'm just doing like manually calling the self method from main thread, but 5,000 times and waiting for the response. Do you know what will happen? Put of memory exception, one memory per thread. Yeah, uh, exactly. Fail to start thread, and on thread, p thread create fail, p threads are unix threads, I think. Java lang out of memory error, unable to create native threads, possibly out of memory process. So, well, not good, right? But why, why it's not, not good? So why the threads are a problem actually here? So normally you will always have a situation where you have like low number of CPU calls, probably a few in the server. I don't know what the biggest servers now have, like uh, like the ones you can get on AWS, for example. I know 64 calls, 128, maybe someone else. What? 128, maybe. 128, right? So, so still not 5,000, right? And uh, so, so basically, what how the operating system cope with this? It creates so-called kernel uh, kernel threads. So kernel threads are the threads that are like uh, running your code, and they, they are being like scheduled on those CPU cores by the operating system. There's like some kind of time slicing between those threads, and the operating system is doing some kind of heuristics. It knows which should like take off the thread from the CPU core. For example, this call to thread sleep is a signal for the CPU, uh, for the operating system. Sorry. There is not going much happen in the next few seconds. You can take off. I, I can take off the uh, thread from the CPU core. So basically, there are those kernel threads. Then we have Java threads. Those are so-called space. Uh, those are user space threads. And what happens uh, with JVM is that actually there's a one-to-one -one mapping with those two. So kernel threads have a corresponding user space thread. And the, the, the maybe bad, sometimes good, but uh, like in our case, bad thing about this is that uh, kernel threads are pretty heavyweight. I mean, uh, I don't know if you like maybe know, but normally in operating system you have like processes, right? And you should ha have threads underneath processes, right? In Linux, there is not much difference between a process and a thread. Basically, the difference is I think if you call fork, then you say if you should uh, if they should like share the memory or not. Basically. Uh, Linux threads are the same as uh, mm, processes and they're like heavyweight. So basically, they each of them take one megabyte of stack. So um, 
uh, at least this is like standard for Java. This is like a XSS uh, switch that you can control this. So think about this. You are starting 5,000 threads. If each of those take one megabyte for nothing, it's just like spin ups and there's like five gigabytes of RAM taken without doing any job, right? So basically, what you can expect is to have like few k of active threads, but not more. Uh, otherwise, you'll get this this error that we saw. So basically, what, how people like uh, cope with this? They use thread pools, but this is not solving our problem, right? If we even would have thread pools, then still we would have delays in handling the solution. So basically, again, back to the drawing board. How can we like solve this problem? So here comes future on a white horse with the with the rescue. <laughs> so like. Uh, that was the place. That was the place in time that everyone turned into like async programming. So if you would like to do async programming simply by like wrapping this call to this database get with a future, just over here, this won't work, right? Because like if you do it, you're still going to eat a thread each time. So basically, it's even worse because if you don't put a proper uh, how it's called thread thread pool underneath that will like create more threads as you as you call it you can deadlock easily. So this is like a very bad idea. What you actually need, oh no, don't do this. Uh, what you actually need is you, your database has to have this support for async programming. Uh, so for example, if you're using JDBC, JDBC is like a synchronous protocol, so you cannot never have uh, asynchronous calls over there. But basically, for example, Mongo has this async driver. There is R2DBC that's also reactive, like a counterpart to JDBC. So basically, what I'm doing here is I have a uh, s executor with four threads. I've changed the uh, signature to return future, uh, and I'm simulating the delay of five seconds with the uh, executor schedule. So in five seconds, I will fulfill a promise and return the future filled with the data from the database. Right. So um, let's run. Yeah. Questions. Okay. Let's run the simulation. So I've turned off all the all the printing out, so we we'll only see the execution time. Ah, sorry. Uh, before the simulation, how the how the this code over here should look like, right? So so I wrote it in a style with the callback, calling on complete on the future, and like handling all the all the cases. But like basically, it looks very similar to what we did before with the synchronous version. And when we run it, five seconds. All clients get their answers, yay. So it's, it's, it's what we expected, right? So is it like all good and, and fine? So future is great, but there are like things that uh, they change in the programming style we do. So basically, uh, there was this interesting blog post about function colors, what it, what, was, what it was about. So there was this like idea that you have this language that you have like functions of two types, one is red functions and the other is blue functions. Mm -hmm. So how this works is that you can call a blue function from the red function, but not vice versa. And this is exactly the situation with future, right? You can call, you can call a synchronous uh, function from a function that returns future, but not the other way around, right? You need to like, so, so they're like contagious. So if you have like future in one method, then probably all your methods will be like in future. So this changes your programming stand totally, totally from like this uh, statements, right, into flat map is your new semicolon, right? Mm -hmm. Why semicolon? Because like in Java you would put semicolon on each of the lines, right? In Scala you don't need to, but basically now you need to do like all everything in this uh, for comprehension, right? To have this one after another. And the, the biggest, I think, downside of this is that it doesn't work with the language constructs. And this is something I, like I understood very recently, that actually, like, you cannot use future, for example, with try catch, try finally, on with, or with while, right? If you have a function that returns a boolean, you can call it in while, right? But you cannot call future of boolean in while. So basically, now the whole concept of future is being like alien to the language itself. So that's why we have all those like special combinators for error handling, repeating, blah, 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 the whole mouse thing and stuff like that. Um, so the other downside is that the JVM platform itself is like thread-based. It's built around threads. 
when you're using futures, you're basically jumping from one thread to another. So you're like losing all the observability, the buggers, tooling, thread locals. Like if you have stack traces, the stack traces was coming from some kind of strange lambda. You don't know what was the actual calling uh, down, down that hierarchy, right? So future introduces its own like bay of problems. Someone might ask, uh, what about async await? Because there's a concept of async await, for example, something similar as in Kotlin, coroutines, you have async await in Rust, uh, JavaScript has async await, C sharp has async await. So you all know how async await works, more or less. It's basically very similar to future, but like you just say that the function is async and you need to call await when you want to do it. The problem is that async await still calls the functions. So we still cannot call asynchronous from synchronous, blah, blah, blah. Uh, blocking still blocks. So you need to have like specialized functions for, for example, the things like, for example, this thread sleep wouldn't work still, right? If, even if you have async await in Java. The good thing is that async await actually supports native constructs like this try catch. So this is actually nice. Uh, async await is pretty popular because it's easy to implement in the compiler front end. Because for example, like let's take Kotlin for example. So they implemented those code routines, like JetBrains cannot affect the JVM because they are not the owner, right? But they can like take the Kotlin compiler and like alter the code in while compiling to add this support for async await. Sometimes it's the only option. For example, in JavaScript, when, when, when people wanted to do some kind of let's say asynchronous programming, there was like a lot of JavaScript code already that like uh, assume that there is only one thread running. So there was no, no other option. And I think interesting observation is that when you're doing async await, where you can schedule uh, another routine. So with async await, it's actually, you cannot schedule it nowhere unless you're allowed. So you're calling this await. With threads, you're able to schedule everywhere unless it's forbidden. This is like an observation. And now the C sharp code. So this is an example of this async await. So here's like, like a class with a single method, add one. It returns this task of int, has this async uh, suffix. So this is like coloring the function. And we call this task delay. So this is like a sleep in JVM for one second bef before we return the, the answer, right? And what the compiler does with this, it basically transforms into like a, a structure that has encoded a state machine. So basically, all async await are compiled to this. So this is what you will get underneath. So there is like this private structure over here. That's this I async state machine. It like controls all the all the transitions between states, and this is the function itself that will jump on the state machine. So as you see, this is like not for free actually. And uh, actually, you can a little bit optimize. That's the C sharp like. specialist here, so <laughs> that doesn't matter. Yeah, well, what? Do you know what specialized or something? Um, you can, uh, there's like a builder which is usually, um, I mean, uh, there, there's a bunch of allocations that you can uh, basically avoid by using some special uh, uh, mm. annotations, let's say, that let you to uh, avoid classes in favor of strings. but yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. okay now to the main character of the evening, so Loom. So how does Loom changes the situation? Because this is probably what we we're, were all like waiting for. So this, so the loops is like, um, so we take the old code, multi-threading code. So this looks the same as before, right? Just we need to change how we create threads. So I'm using a thread factory of virtual threads. And basically, like we could do like a thread virtual new. Well, there are other ways to create a virtual thread. But basically, uh, sorry, the, the main the main part stays the same, right? This is the same synchronous logic we had. We're using the synchronous version of the database. So JDBC is, is okay. We're still doing thread still. And now let's run the simulation. It's the same as with futures. So how how does long long like do it underneath? So we need to talk about what, like some kind of new terms that La Loom uh, introduces. Them. So first of all, what, did, what is this virtual thread thing? So this virtual thread is a lightweight, cheap user thread, and we can have millions of those. So basically, uh, let's say for, for, for normal cases, you don't need to like count them. 
we have something called carrier threads. So those are the real threads that, that have mapping to those kernel threads. They are actually running those user threads. So we have some kind of multiplexing, like my millions of virtual threads, a few uh, carrier threads, and they are being like mounted. I think this is the official uh, naming in the in the JDK uh, documentation that the virtual thread is mounted on the carrier thread until it blocks. So for example, call to this thread sleep. And when it's blocked, and when it's blocked, it's being unmounted from the virtual thread, from the carrier thread, and another virtual thread can be put on the carrier thread. And uh, the uh, the state of this thread is put into the heap. So that's the cost. So basically, you're putting some kind of pressure on the GC because those thread needs to land in the heap. What are the pros of this uh, concept? So basically, stack is a lot smaller. So the, the, the initial size is 200, 300 bytes. And it expands as you go versus the one megabyte that we saw. And scheduling is also a bit faster, like 200 nanoseconds versus 1 to 10 microseconds. And uh, another thing that you need to like understand uh, how how the uh, how how those the scheduling is happening is like something called continuation. So basically, this is like a software construct. Basically, what it does is that you can like uh, suspend your execution, return return the, the flow to the caller, and when the caller will call you again, you will resume at that place. If you used maybe generators in Python, you would probably know what it is, because this is something very similar. This is like an old thing. Uh, I will show like a simple example how this could work. So I'm, I'm making up this, this API. So you have this object suspend and a method called yield continuation. And uh, Let's have those two uh, methods, one foo and one bar. And what foo does is prints line b, then calls bar, print lines b, call bar, print lines b, blah, blah, blah. And what the bar does is like print line a, yield continuation. We don't know yet what it does, but um, print line a, yield continuation, line a. So what you would expect this to print? Normally, you would say that print line b, a, 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 b, a, 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 right? Basically, that's, that, that, that would like what would be printed in normal case. But what this yield does, this yield continuation, is actually print line B is being printed, then we call bar. So print line A is being printed. Yield continuation jumps out of the bar here. Print line B is being uh, called, then again bar, and bar jumps right after the first call to yield continuation. Prints A, Yield continuation jumps out, jumps in. So basically, this is like resuming the state each time. So it will print B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A. Clear? Clear? Oh, not really. Clear. Not really. So basically, maybe maybe this will be like a better example. So what you have, have a loop over here. So you have this var E. I, uh, equals three, right? So first call to bar loop will go into here, right? The, the while will execute, print line will execute, I will be decremented, yield continuation will jump out here. Then you go over here, B is printed, then it jumps back to bar, but to the last place when the yield continuation was run, and it actually remembers the last state of all the stack and variables, so it like restores it. So on, on second call to bar loop, you will have like uh, two. On third call, you will have like one, etc. So basically, this is how how this continuation concept works. And this is like base for how the loom is implemented underneath. To show you um, to show you a real world example from loom. So this is basically the sleep method that we're calling to the database. The interesting part is here. So basically, it checks if the current thread is instance of virtual thread. Because like Loom is being introduced, but we still have all the old threads. So you can run both. But if you're running the virtual thread, it will call these virtual thread sleep nanos, nanos something. If you're not running the virtual thread, it will call sleep zero, which is basically a call to kernel, this, this function. So it goes the old route, right? Basically, before JDK 19 with Loom, this method was basically this method, nothing else. All the all the Java code that you see here was added. So basically, this is what they did in all of the JDKs blocking methods. They they add support for virtual threads. 
And if we look what this sleep nano does, there are quite a few calls that tick down the stack and we land at something called the do park nanos. So parking is like a term that you are like stopping the thread is being parked. So stopped. And here's the, uh, the relevant part. So the thread is scheduling itself to be unparked in some time in future, sets its state to parking, and calls the CL continuation. So at this point you know that it jumps off, releases the carrier thread, and some other virtual thread can start running at this point, basically. And when the thread is resumed, it resumes over here, goes to finally, blah, blah, blah. And maybe one interesting part is that even if you call this yield continuation, it doesn't need to yield you. It's like up to the scheduler, so you need to like think about this. But this is mostly for the library app, it's not really for, for users of the, of the lib. So that's why they're like checking if they were actually yielded and this sleep time actually passed. Okay, so this is like how Loom works underneath. So someone might ask at this point, um, what about fibers? Because like we already have fibers in CAD, Zyro, etc. So what's the difference, right? So let's look at uh, fibers in, 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 in Zyro, but this is very similar to what is happening in CAD, the implementation. So I like to call fibers in, in, in both of them that what you're basically doing is are while loops peeling onions on executors. Uh, why this? Let's take a sample Zyro application. This is the same application written in two styles. One with full comprehension, one in direct style. So let's look at this one. So we have Zyro succeed, and the succeed is being plot mapped into Zyro sleep of five seconds, right? So what this, what this program actually does, let's try to see what Zyro succeed is. So Zyro succeed actually creates a new Zyro succeed. I think this might be a case class. Uh, maybe a normal class. And what it does, it actually puts this uh, one into lambda, so it freezes it, and like basically it builds a data structure with the code. So this is like the first layer that is being created in Zion. And let's look at the flat map. So flat map also like creates a data structure, this time called flat map, that basically puts the Zio succeed over here and this lambda here, here. So we have like another layer on top of the first Zio succeed. We have another layer called Zio flat map. So if we like put all the things together, this is what this actually is, is this, right? So you have like one layer, second layer, third layer, not yet evaluated. Here. And if we go to the uh, class called Fiber Context. So this is actually the class that does the unpeeling of the Zio program. So actually runs the, the program. So you can find that there's this var, or you can find bars in Zio, who would say, uh, next effect. So this is like the next effect that will be run, right? Yeah, there will be a lot of like, non-functional code right on this slide. And all from Zio. So uh, this is the next effect that will be run. And we have this method run until that takes this max op count parameter. And basically, well, I'll say in a second what this is. So it takes the, this next effect, erases the, uh, the generic arguments. This, this doesn't matter at this point. And spins while it can like unpeel the layers, it can run. And it will try to run. What it does, if, if there is like another Zio to run, it checks. If the max op if the op count that it already did is equals to max op count, and if so, it schedules itself to be run later. So basically, uh, how this works is that like this this loop is like peeling all the layers until it peels max op count of layers, and at this point, it stops and reschedules. So this is basically. Uh, time sharing, how, the, how Zio does time sharing. So basically, each time you do flat map, you give Zio opportunity to take you off the CPU. So this is how, how this is implemented. And let's look at what happens in the if you actually run, if you're not being suspended. So this part here is actually this. So what is tag? So tag is an int taken from the Zio. Why this is written like this? Why this is not like a standard scalar pattern matching? This is like a, 
optimization that instead of like going one by one and doing like the pattern matching, this would create some call like a ta jump table and it will like jump directly to the uh, place that it needs. So this is like optimization. So this switch is something like tail rec from the Scala compiler. And basically, if we look at our application, so the outer layer is IO flat map, so we will land in this case. It will like uh, cast cast it to the Zio flat map and execute accordingly what is what is over there. Uh, so about those tags, how many of them are there? There are 27 tags, all like implementing different different things. For example, forking, async computation, supervising, blah blah blah. But there is one interesting part: yield. So basically, this yield is the thing that you would expect. So if you if you as a programmer will like make a yield, you're saying to the runtime, I'm okay if you want to take the CPU, I'm okay for it for you to do it. So you can like uh, run me later. And this is like the same code that was over here, right? Basically, very similar. Okay, let's also look at this sleep method because this is the last part. So not looking into details what this async interrupt is, etc. The, the most important part is that what they do is they schedule themselves on a global scheduler, so some kind of executor. So Zio cannot overcome the problems of the platform itself, right? So blocking still blocks, they need to come up with their own operators. That's why you cannot use thread sleep, you need to use Zio sleep. So La Loom can do more than, than, than fibers in, in Zio or Cat's effect. And I would say that uh, Loom can be like a good addition. It can simplify the runtime. So about fibers. So I already said that uh, they need to introduce their own operations, like for example, the sleep. There is a silent assumption you don't do much computation in flat map, because each time, if you would like do a lot of computation in a single flat map, you would basically hold the thread. So there would be no time slicing. So there's a silent assumption that we will like create a lot of those layers. If I remember correctly, this max opcom parameter we're talking about was something like 10,000 layers or something. So basically a lot. And because the code is written in this style, it feels like if you're calling Java, basically you feel like calling into like a, I don't know, other language basically. So something like a foreign function interface. And that's why they call all the Java functions unsafe. And basically like, I think like fibers can benefit from Loom, how we will see. Okay, so some things that might affect all of us, some consequences of Loom. So basically, if you want to use Loom, what you need to do, what changes do you need to do in your code? Uh, so first of all, you don't need to learn no new stuff. The old code works. I mean the old code, the old synchronous code, <laughs> not the code that most people write right now. What you actually need to unlearn is to stop using thread pools, because like you need you, you don't need to like uh, treat pool, uh, threads as uh, expensive resources. You can use executors, but only the ones that create those cheap virtual threads. And that's basically it. Like there, there's like as you saw, I didn't make any changes to the database code, to the business code. It just walked out of the box. From like a Scala perspective. So we have like a simple, simple, uh, simple future application here. So we count from one to one hundred thousand, and we map this each of those ints to a future that does thread sleep and returns one, and then we call a future sequence that will like take like change the list of futures to a single future with the list, right? And we try to sum this. So basically, in current like uh, style, you would blow up with too many threads, or if you would have like a limited number of threads, you would have, for example, only four threads, you would go like four seconds, four seconds, four seconds, and this would take like, what? 200, this 125,000 seconds. It would take 25,000 seconds to actually execute. Uh, with with LAM, if you create this virtual, this execution context with this new virtual thread per task executor, this finishes after one second, instantly. Okay, one thing that uh, you, like, you need to be aware, so watch out for JNI. 
So if if your Java code for some reason is calling into native code like C or something, this is not happening a lot. But for example, there are very surprising places like for example Oracle database driver. I was told that it has its own networking stack written in C. So if you call C code, that all bets are off. The thread will be eaten, and you cannot do much about it. So you need to uh, be aware of this. Mm. Can you go to the previous slide for yeah. a moment? Uh, this is a new virtual thread. This is something uh, already from Scala, or this, this is, is this is Java. Executors ah, okay. are Java. Okay. Ah, okay. Executors are Java things. So if you have this JDK 19 version, there's this thing. Ah, okay. Of course, Zio and other stuff you can also like pass their your own executors. So you can try it on on Cats and, and on Zio if you want. I think you need to override some method on this Zio app default or something to pass your own executor. Okay, scheduling fairness. That, that's one interesting thing. There was this. Uh, there was lately a blog post from a guy named Gunnar Morling. Uh, this blog post was called Loom and Thread Fairness. So, uh, like basically, Gunnar was like testing out Loom. So he wrote a simple application. That what it does, it uh, basically uses a thread executor, cached thread pool. How thre cached thread pools work? It gives you a new thread every time you ask it for a new thread. If it already has a cached thread, it will give you that cached thread. If the threads are not used for, I don't know, I think 60 seconds, then they're like tiered down and they don't eat up resources. So this is like a very good executor for short, short-lived uh, tasks. So what Gunnar did is he started 64 threads. And so he submitted uh, those 64 threads. And what he did, he was trying to count from one 100 million, but by using big integer. Why big integer? Because it's like a lot more CPU, CPU intensive than using like normal ints. So because like big integer has like a moment uh, precision, but you need to pay for the CPU. So basically, 64 threads counting from zero to 100 million, and uh, he also recorded the time, and then he plotted it. So this is work clock time scheduling to finish the task. So 64 threads. They all finished at more or less the same time, right? More or less the same time, because like there were like native threads. They were scheduled by the operating system. So operating system is trying to schedule them more or less fairly. So they finished more or less at the same time. Uh, expected result. Now he changed the executor to long executor. And what happened? <laughs> So basically, uh, Gunnar on his uh, computer has eight threads. And when he created a mm, Loom executor, this virtual thread executor, it has eight carrier threads down there. And it created 64 virtual threads on top. And they were running like from the start till the end, because there were no blocking operation during the computation, right? That's why the, the thread is never like taken off the CPU. So it like counts to one million, eight of them, then eight of them, eight of them, blah, 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 until all of them are done. This doesn't mean that it's faster. It just means that like the latency is different. So because latency is pretty important in like servers, this might come to you as a, some kind of like a surprise. Then he changed uh, this JDK virtual thread scheduler parallelism to 16. So like he faked that he has 16 cores. So he had 16 uh, carrier threads. So like the distribution changed. And then what he did, he introduced every 1 million operations a thread slip of 1 second. So this is like a blocking operation, right? So we are giving the JVM uh, uh, opportunity to yield to another virtual thread. And we're back at the normal distribution. And interestingly, I think it's even more evenly distributed than the original one from, from Linux. So basically, uh, there was like a very heated discussion on Twitter. Is this like a good thing or a bad thing? The uh, tech lead of Loom also got, got involved, etc. I think the confusion comes from like, Make, like taking two, two different terms and thinking about them as, as one thing. So basically, the confusion between what is concurrency and what is parallelism. So basically, when we're talking about concurrency, 
you will have like a number of independent tasks, like for example, server serving HTTP requests. You have like number of independent requests, right? They don't depend on each other. And you need to schedule them on a set of computing resources. So basically they are competing for, for resources. And when you want to like have some kind of like a metric for performance, it's throughput. So number of tasks per unit of time. So how many tasks you can do in a unit of time. And this is basically what La Loom uh, helps you with. Now, parallelism is something different. You have like a single task that can be split into like multiple independent ones. I don't know, maybe you did something like uh, ray tracing or generating images. So you can like split the display into four parts, you run four threads, and they're like working on the same task, right? So they are cooperating. And the key metric is latency. So you, you're interested how fast the whole thing will, will end up. Okay, getting to the uh, final thoughts, the most, uh, let's say, um, controversial part, because I will also involve my, my experience from Go. <laughs> so first of all, uh, pools and limits. So like I said, thread pools are no longer relevant. So you don't need to use thread pools or maybe those executors with virtual thread. But there are still other resources, like for example, database connections that you need to pull. You, cannot ha you can have like millions of threads, but you cannot have millions of connections to the database. So you still use uh, pools. And, and exactly this is, that, that is what is happening, for example, in, in GoLine. Basically, you can have, they are called Go routines. You can have like hundreds millions of Go routines, but we still use pooling there to the database. Maybe there will be some kind of innovation. For example, I don't know, you can share the connection and multiplex to the connection, I don't know. But at this point, you need to do pooling of this, of this, uh, of this thing. OK, what about the code that you write every day? So I have a, like a simple uh, service here, uh, like actually two services, for example. Let's imagine we have uh, this product service that we pass a query, and it will like find you a product for this query. And we have this ad service that tries to find the relevant ad based on the user. And we have this controller that calls both of them, right? With query, with content, puts it up in the for comprehension and returns, returns the result. So basically, all of this code is built around the future. And as we saw, with Loom, we don't need futures. So how would you ta change this code? What would be your idea to change this code if we don't need futures at this point? So what would you change the futures to? Maybe that's the right question. Since you don't need asynchrony in, in the code. I think the first thing that might come to, to, to the mind is uh, try. Because try is basically like a synchronous version of future. Or either with the uh, left field with throwable, right? But to be honest, like also like looking into my uh, experience from Go, I would use something else, something actually that comes from CAT. There's this type IO. So IO is like either. It can be left, it can be right, so it can be both tryable and shop. It can be tryable and shopping items, but it can be both at the same time. Because this is something that you might want at some point. Why? I will tell that in a second. I just wanted to tell you that. Although we have this, this, this method is totally synchronous from outside, you can still use futures here. But you can, without problem, do a wait result. And it's safe. Now, it won't eat a thread. It's like won't uh, improve, like increase the latency. It eat up resources on something. OK, now let's go back to why I'm thinking that we should like be able to, at the same time, return the result and maybe an error. Let's look at the like the calls. So we have the search method. It calls find products in one thread and find relevant ads in other threads, right? And we don't even actually know how many threads are started beneath. So can you tell me what's the actual stack trace of this method? This doesn't the question doesn't even make sense. There is no single path of execution over here. What about errors? Sorry, stack trace. What about errors? For example, let's say this failed and this failed. What kind of trouble you should return? So if we're thinking about errors of values, then maybe we should like return both of them. 
And also, maybe, for example, it's not important that this, this uh, somehow failed. Maybe this was a call, call to cache, and like it failed. So we did a like, call to a normal service. But you still maybe want to like, report this. And this should be like your, your decision, your design decision, right? It shouldn't be the uh, like decision of someone who like uh, designed future 15 years ago and said there's like a single throwable that you can put into future, right? So this, so this is not easily uh, visible. And this concurrency actually is also like something that is pretty hard. So there will be like a follow-up to Loom. This is uh, another GAP that will follow the Loom something called structured concurrency. So I don't want to like deep, very dive into this, just give you, if you want to read about it, just like find it out on the internet. But basically, you create a scope, like something like you have like between curly braces, right? You create a scope, and each of the variable, if you go out of the scope, disappears, right? So this is something similar. So you create a scope, you can create threads, if, the, if you go out of the scope, all the threads, you are sure that they are already done and gone. So this is something that, that will, like, the next Jeff will introduce. So this is, like, one future is being called. This is a code from the official JAP 438. Find user is called, fetch order is called. They are joining on both of those calls. Throwing it failed. I don't know what they are throwing, <laughs> which one of those. And blocking call to resolve. I mean, uh, join uh, gives you, like, you're sure that after join, both results are ready for you. Why this is needed? Why this is needed? This is, uh, the, the, there's a, like, you know what's like structured programming? Whiles, ifs, right? Mm -hmm. Before that, you had go-tos, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So this is something similar. For example, in Go, and that's a bad thing, you can like start those Go routines by just writing before the function Go. And you have like millions of running functions you don't know where, you don't know if they outleave your call or not. So this like makes sure that if you, if you exit this handle function, both of those are already done. They are not running. So it can end up like uh, like with I.O. that you have everything run on the I.O. at the end. So it's like it would be in the main function, function of an application and everything else is in a way asynchronous. But yeah, uh, I mean, look at this from the perspective of a client. You're calling this handle function. Okay. This returns a response, so you're being blocked, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And normally if you would start a thread, like new thread start, and you would do some kind of like a mistake, you can leak the thre thread, right? The thread might outlive this call to this handle function. Okay. This structure task scope makes sure that nothing that you start here, mm -hmm. any kind of thread, okay. will, will outlive the call. Okay. Okay. So like basically, the call to the, the threads are between those two curly braces, the same as with the variables. Okay. If you're un after this curly brace, the threads are gone. Okay, uh, only a few slides left. <laughs> mm, streams and push and pull streams. So basically, yeah, streams are also something that is pretty popular in, in Scala. And uh, I wanted to look at, at, at those because they are like solving problems with asynchrony and we are now fighting asynchrony. So basically, when you have like a push stream, so basically a push stream is the one that like you have a producer that is like creating uh, things for you and it's not like, it's not being called, it just does it from itself, right? A good example would be you want to go through through the Kafka topic and reprocess it, right? So you just read, transform, and pass it along to consumer, and the consumer might not keep up, right? Because you might be like passing, uh, processing the topic faster than the consumer is able to consume. So there needs to be some kind of back pressure. So you have all those reactive flows, streams, etc., etc. Funny thing is that this back pressure is only needed when you have asynchronous. So this is a problem that is only specific to asynchronous code. When you're communicating over blocking queues, that is like legal now in Loom and not eating threads. Basically, if you want to like, uh, read another message from Kafka and there's no place in the blocking queue, you are being blocked yourself and you're waiting for the consumer to keep up. So you get it for free. So the producer naturally waits for consumer. 
On the other hand, if we have like pool streams, for example, FS2, uh, you might have a problem that you're overwhelming the, uh, the downstream service that you're calling. For example, you might have, I don't know, 100,000 ints and you want to call a REST service, right? You might do a DDoS attack if you're not uh, limiting the concurrency. The thing I disliked in, for example, in all those streaming services is you had like multiple calls to things like map async. So you had like different places when you had like these calls to, 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 to multiple threads. And the problem was it was never actually sure how many calls you're doing at a, at a certain uh, time. Off. Let's, let's get back to this, uh, to this uh, search example. You might not know that this execution path, this and this are calling Redis, because you're using Redis as some kind of, I don't know, cache, and you're, for some reason, like overwhelming Redis, and you're not even aware. And with streams, it's really easy, actually, because you have like different places in streams when you're like fanning out, fanning back, back pressure in all the ways. So basically, there's like a simple uh, solution to this, semaphores. The semaphores that like you we had for I don't know last 40 years. So you just create a global semaphore next to Redis, and everything goes through the semaphore. And you have like a global concurrency limit, and that's exactly what is needed because you want to control concurrency to your external services on the global level. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? The semaphore under the hood is actually using something like thread sleep, and this is uh, safe uh, uh, with Loom because uh, uh, it's kind of the API is already changed. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, exactly. The same as thread sleep. Yeah, the thread. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so basically, if someone was, because uh, uh, probably no one here did ever uh, copy code from the uh, JVM like sleep or, or uh, semaphore, but I guess some libraries might. Mm -hmm. And they need to update their code with the uh, loop in mind, otherwise everything will break. No, it won't break, but uh, I mean it won't work uh, as intended. I mean, the semaphore was in, J in uh, JDK for a lot of years, but now it's just like before you would need to like handle the threads yourself. Now it will be like done for you. Mm -hmm. For you, like I, I mean, there are already like standard servers maybe you know about, and like uh, not Netty, but Jetty. Jetty is like a standard server container, they were doing some kind of uh, experiments already, it works, they said that it doesn't work well, <laughs> so we'll see, but so, some, someone else said that they had some kind of like fault in the methodology, how they were like testing it. But basically, uh, the thing was that like you had this thread per request and it should automatically somehow like change to this new carrier thread virtual thread model mm -hmm. and just switch it on its own and use a lot of less res resources. Is uh, this Loom project already merged to main branch? On yes, Java? Okay. it was lately merged, I think like uh, two weeks ago or three okay. weeks ago or something like that. So in the next uh, year it will be available? Yeah, I think it, it will show up in the JDK 19 first, so I think October this year. And uh, But I, 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 what I believe, because basically Loom makes in some sense obsolete the whole uh, reactive Java thing, right? But on the other hand, this reactive thing gives you a lot of good combinators that maybe you would like to have. Mm -hmm. So I think they will be some. I think just they will be like post Loom libraries built with Loom in mind, and they should be like easier and like uh, better suited to the new way how the platform works. So uh, regarding the slide where you compared the parallelism uh, versus concurrency, and then you said that. Uh, you can optimize either to latency or trooper. And uh, basically, uh, but this is just a side note, like uh, there are some uh, uh, languages that uh, have only one thread, like, uh, I don't know, Node.js mm -hmm. or uh, a few others. And, uh, and I, what I think is that it shouldn't be an issue that you uh, might uh, have like only eight uh, this virtual threads because it's still eight times better than what Node has. So mm -hmm. it shouldn't be much of an issue. I mean that I think that there might be like a scenarios when you actually want to create a thread pool when you have like one carrier thread mm -hmm. and like few virtual threads. Yeah, you you might want to have this kind of, mm -hmm. for example, I don't know, maybe to not do some kind of synchronization. Interesting. 
Make some sense, right? Nice, right, so thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much for attending our meetup and big applause for all of you for like attending and being ready to rebuild the community after the pandemic. So thank you so much. So as I promised, we might go for a beer in a bar nearby. Who's like feeling like going out still? I know it's late, but your watches, no problem. Uh, Tom, I said it's so I can translate that we are going. So yeah, we are going. We need to clean up the space a little bit, and then we will meet outside and just go somewhere. So thank you, and see you next month, hopefully.